Hello and welcome to this episode of Video Learning Lab. Today I'm joined by Liz Steffen, who is currently serving as a CEO and co-founder of Nifty Learning, which helps companies save 20% of their training budgets and turn training costs into strategic investments. She brings her experience working in Fortune 500 companies through Xerox, helping to develop scaled enterprise solutions for her clients. She's also the host of the L&D Spotlight podcast, and through this platform, she explores various facets of learning and development, bringing insights from industry experts and thought leaders to a wider audience. Liz, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful to have you. So uh, to get us kicked off, um, about a week ago, I thought I saw a, uh, a post from Donald Taylor that I think perfectly sums up what you and I had discussed before we had hit record, which is this idea that uh, L&D has, has an image problem in the organization. And so just to, for, to catch everybody else up, uh, essentially, this was Donald Taylor's five takeaways from what he's seen across the year. And one of those takeaways that I want to narrow it on is that l and must reimagine itself and change its image. And he said, technological change represents l and with an opportunity to shift from the chore of producing courses to providing business value by developing people in line with organizational needs. And then he has a couple action steps to do this. But before we get into the meat of what we talk about today, I'm wondering, what is your take? What do you think about this hot take on the L&D field and this need to reimagine itself and change its image? I don't know if it's such a hot take, quite honestly. <laughs> I feel it's the take, yes. or it's, it's becoming the take, which is both good and bad at the same time. The, the reason we're here is the problem itself, let's say. Um, um, I think my favorite quote on this uh, entire idea is coming from um, an episode that I did also on the podcast with uh, Dr. Clark Quinn. And among others, he said that l and is a faith-based industry. I think this was my favorite <laughs> summary of the current situation, which is that unfortunately, there's not enough data driving many of the decisions, the budgeting, the strategic investments in learning and development in companies. Um, and I think there are many reasons why that happens, and we're going to dive into those uh, later. Um, I agree, there has to be some sort of re rebranding, rescoping of the function and a stronger connection with the with data. Yeah, it, it definitely this, this is something that I've heard as well from the folks that we spoke to on the podcast that, you know, maybe it's a lack of data systems, maybe it's lack of data skills and data literacy and understanding data impact, or even when you don't have the quantitative data, how you're using qualitative data to inform the initiatives that you have. So data is definitely one of those, uh, one of the the major drivers for why L&D has this image. I agree with you there. I, I'm, I'm curious if we could take a step back and kind of address address what we're what I'm calling the legacy of, of learning and development. This is uh, a story where I think everyone in the organization has some sort of past experience with learning. They understand what that is on a personal level, but when it comes to um, the business and the company and what learning and development does, I think nobody can quite put a finger on exactly what that means or what value that drives. And uh, um, it, from your perspective, you know, what are the core elements of l and d's legacy that we still see impacting today's practices you you touched on a couple of the um, important points there so i think one aspect of it is what kind of the, the kind of work that was used to uh, was being done and is being done now in learning and development in companies is a bit outdated not that it's bad but it needs to be there has to be more added to it so it's fine if we talk about instructional design or curating content or the you know typical learning needs analysis and so on this is expected but we didn't used to have a focus on data and it didn't used to be such an important thing maybe because we didn't think about it that much or also we didn't have the necessary tools. And now with AI coming in, it's almost almost like it's taking away from the um, act of doing any sort of manual or whatever data related process. And it's like, mm. just at least put data on top of whatever it is that's going on so that you have some insights, you let the algorithms inform some of your decision. We, 
we in LND haven't historically been that close to data. It probably for a couple of reasons, I would say one of them is there hasn't been that much pressure. I mm. think it, there isn't, or it's become, it's the pressure is starting to, to grow. I would say to be more data driven, but historically it wasn't just people wouldn't be thinking about data, right? You'd be thinking about someone is asking for some training typically, uh, your job is to deliver on that request. You deliver, the training happens, everybody's happy, five-star review, going back to work. But there was no connection necessarily with the act of, you know, retention, putting that knowledge to work. Has it improved performance? Do we feed, back that, feed that back into the learning creation process, the learning design process? So now, because every business function is under more scrutiny, I would say, uh, just because of you know, global economic context or whatever, um, L&D is also having to um, do like a self x-ray, let's say, and uh, figure out whether the kind of um, effort that's been, that has been invested in L&D so far is the right kind of effort to keep investing or whether we should be mm -hmm. making some adjustments. And I, I, I will probably go back to data every every time in this conversation but now since we have better technology that can help us track many things now that we have uh, better ways to also track how people work because that's kind of been a fuzzy area as well we can start looking at learning as a targeted strategic investment that should make a change in a business metric and mm -hmm. quite frankly business metrics are the the reason I would venture to say L&D even exists. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, I think what you're mentioning about, uh, you know, this is the conversation I think the, that I've been having uh, all year with a lot of experts, which is L&D needs to get closer to the business. It needs to speak the language of the business, and that includes data, but also translating um, time away from desks or um, whether it's training programs or implementing different instructional resources or job aids uh, to help with performance, it's making sure that uh, that the rest of the business understands what those inputs lead to and how it leads to impact. I'm curious when you when you're when you're starting off with a client and you said L and D needs to do this self X ray and understand kind of what their context is, how people work, how data is collected. Where do you often start? What are the the top three, you know, the top one or top three things that you do with a client to help them go through that self X ray and get started on that process towards speaking the language of the business? Um, I the usually the first question I ask if is if they're doing any if they have any performance processes and if they're getting any data out of that many companies would say that they have more robust processes around things like sales or customer support, um, things that are more easily measured or that have to do with hard skills. It becomes a bit more complicated when we're talking about soft skills or leadership. How do you measure leadership? How do you understand an improvement overall in leadership? Um, then I ask if their current setup is such that the performance data feeds back into the learning strategy design. Mm. Quite often there's a disconnect and it's mostly because there are two different or, or separate business functions that handle these responsibilities. And I think this is actually um, one of the problems that LND has is that and I'm I'm not gonna sound like a broken record, but uh, you always hear that companies work in silos and you have to break down silos and what does that mean and how do you do it? But I think L and D is unfortunately a very good example of working in a silo, where you receive a request, so the request sort of like penetrates your bubble, and within your bubble you start feeling like you're doing a lot of things, right? You're sourcing content, you're creating, you're designing, you're um, making all of these wonderful things happen, you're publishing it into the LMS or whichever platform, you distribute it to people, you start seeing uh, adoption and so on, but you're still inside the bubble, you haven't necessarily uh, allowed that performance data to inform for example your learning design process so that when you launch and you start seeing that beautiful adoption and thinking that wow you're doing amazing things 
that you have to actually go one step beyond that and see if the performance itself gets improved, not just that people are accessing the course that you just launched. So, yeah. Um, yeah, to, to, to what you're mentioning, I think that, that's an interesting visual and I, I, a, a couple things come to mind. One is um, you're talking about not just creating these resources or creating these plans um, or creating this, this type of support for the function that's asking for uh, help with change, but you're also making sure that there's an implementation plan, there's ongoing tracking of performance. I think this is uh, this reminds me of another conversation that that I had recently, um, I think with um, with Egla, where it's about bringing this idea of a product life cycle into uh, L and D, where you don't just if you were to create a product and you were to market it out to people, you wouldn't just say you know here's an iPhone, have the i buy the iPhone have a nice day, we're going to work on something completely different. You look at the ongoing performance of it. You look at how you're going to iterate on that product. You look at people's reception of what that idea is and kind of to sum up, and hopefully I'm not summing up too much, to what you're saying is that, you know, often L&D creates these, um, creates these training products or other instructional resources or performance support that gets released back into the organization. And then we just go off and look for the next thing to do. Whereas we should be checking back in with our original, uh, our original collaborator, collaborator, collaborators, my goodness, it's a Wednesday and seeing, <laughs> do these, um, did this, did this prototype, did this product, did it, uh, is it going well or do we need to make changes and is it doing what you're, it's supposed to do? Is that, is that sound, um, is that too much of an assumption or um, it, no, are no. we on the same page? Mm -hmm. I agree. I really like this approach. Um, I, um, I, I also do a bit of startup mentoring on the side. And one of the things that I like to talk about is customer validation and um, we had this uh, mantra from, we also went through Techstars a while ago and uh, the managing director there, uh, Jag, told us, never forget it's a business, not a product. I like to, I like it mm. when I see people introducing product related or business related concepts into l &D because I think it challenges a bit the old thinking. Um, I think whenever we build something, whether it's specifically an l &D product or anything else, it's healthy to also think about it kind of from like a, a business standpoint. So if you're building something, if it's shoes or if it's tech or if it's an L&D product and you want to you want to sell it, but not just sell it for the sake of making a profit, but rather for the sake of adding value to that person's life. In our case, the L&D product adds value to the person's life in the sense that it amplifies maybe two areas. One of them is definitely work related. And the other one is personal improvement let's say right but mm -hmm. the business the the employer cares very much about the work improvement aspects so then your l d product addresses or should address the value that you can add to that person's work persona work activities and so on so then it's very healthy to think about it specifically in those terms and that's why i bring performance into the conversation performance is the thing that is important for the business that's their value metric right mm -hmm. whichever way you're measuring that performance there must be some kpis each division each role has its own kpis ideally you have that mapped out and you're working through a, a robust performance process but that is the thing that lnd one of the thing but probably the most important thing that lnd should take into account whenever they even start thinking about a learning product and then if your mentality changes and you start thinking about it like that, then you do some validation, you do some initial interviews, you push back when the question is wrong or it, it's defocused from the problem you're trying to address. And then you start doing this, indeed, a product life cycle, right? You do these interviews, you figure out what the problem is, you validate that this is the problem, you think about ways to address it. Sometimes they are L&D solutions, sometimes they're not. It's okay to say no, and it's not an L&D solution. I would say it's encouraged. Um, and then when you start launching it, you see if it does the thing you assume mm. it's supposed to do, right? Is it improving that performance aspect? Is it bringing value to the business? 
if not, or if not in the amount that you initially assumed, can you tweak some things? Can you make improvements? Can you launch a new version? Can you do mm -hmm. some A-B testing? Anything like that, that would help you build a valuable L&D product for the business and for ultimately the people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm I'm curious. So so we're touching on a lot of different things here as we're, you know, kind of addressing what is the legacy of L and D and also this kind of overarching topic of should we rebrand? Should we start from the ground up? There's a, a couple of things that we've covered so far. So there's this idea of L and D being a business within a business, which I think is a great way. It, I think adds a little bit of urgency to the work uh that L and D does within the business, mean uh, within the organization, meaning you're not just there to replicate a classroom model where somebody has asked you to teach a subject because nobody's learning for the sake of learning. The, the offering that you have is supposed to guarantee some sort of performance. So there's that idea of a business, you know, a business within a business where, you know, you have products and services that you offer and the success of your business de depends on you being able to deliver on performance. So there's that aspect of it. And with that tied to that is this idea of, um, a product mindset where you are really getting in depth with your stakeholders, with the end users of the product. You're, you know, really defining the problem and also the performance as clearly as, as, uh, and understandably as possible so that you can measure, you know, the progress of uh, whether or not your, your, your product or service is successful. So we have a pro product mindset in there as well. Are there any other, are there any other big, and I'm sure, you know, we could go through a whole laundry list of them, but uh, are there any other really big problems that are, are kind of, uh, that, that are, are obstacles to us being able to change how the rest of the organi organization perceives L and D as a, um, as a function within the business? That's probably my favorite question and the most difficult one to answer, I would say, <laughs> um, um, you mentioned urgency. I think this is one of the reasons why L&D hasn't really changed that much or, and also one of the reasons why it's starting to feel some pressure. Um, because there's data now and everything has to be data driven because money is expensive and time is expensive and so on. Um, now a function that hasn't historically been data driven needs to uh, do a facelift. Like now we do data, now we measure ROI, now we look at impact. Okay, beautiful. Mm -hmm. There hasn't been urgency because usually the urgency, I would say, would have kind of been decided or not decided, but determined by... Um, how quickly you can deliver the thing, the thing usually being of some form of training or some form of e-learning. Mm -hmm. uh, and that isn't always, or I can't say that's being a problem, right? Someone comes and says, I need training on public speaking skills or I need uh, an e-learning on anti-harassment, right? That's not a problem. There's a turnover time you deliver, everybody's happy. But since now we're talking about real business impact, real business impact isn't measured by ticking the box of attendance or the fact that you finished the course. Real impact is, is there harassment happening in the organization? Are we doing all the safety things that we're supposed to be doing? Has our sales process improved or things like that, right? So things mm -hmm. that actually transform into value for the business. So urgency, I think, is healthy i'm happy it's happening mm -hmm. um i think it's also creating a bit of a problem let's say in the sense that with generative ai coming in and with a lot of people in lnd still thinking that their job is to deliver on content i'm seeing a lot of we can help you build courses faster but i don't think that was ever truly the problem of L&D, the speed at which we create or curate content. Mm -hmm. I think the problem still is that whichever content we deliver isn't necessarily connected to and influencing value. Mm -hmm. So I want to say that urgency is kind of pushing L&D into the acknowledgement of the value chain or the acknowledgement that they have to provide value. Mm -hmm. So now we're going into 
uh, and kind of looping back to that idea of, okay, we're, we have to connect learning with true improvement of things that matter for the business. Mm -hmm. And I know that I keep talking about performance. I don't think it's fair to say that the only thing that's important is performance because people's engagement and comfort at work is also very important. I don't think you can get performance at all costs because at some point it becomes very expensive. You don't factor in that people are people and they have lives and needs and expectations. Um, but I think it's very important for L&D to kind of reposition itself in relation to the value it adds to the business. And that mm. kind of reframing would would kind of force the L&D professional or help the L&D professional think about what is really important to deliver. And mm -hmm. when I say this, I mean, for example, I consider an important deliverable uh, a good, good conversation about are we focusing on the problem? Mm -hmm. Because if someone comes in and says, I need training on this, they're, they're giving you a solution, giving you the L&D person a solution, right? And that's mm -hmm. not what you want to continue to be doing because that will keep you in a place where you are not able to see if you're adding value. So then you as the L&D person who understands adult learning principles, who understands content creation, who understands engagement and so on, you should ask, and I think it's a very legitimate question, what is the problem that you're observing? And you should refocus your requester on the problem that they're facing because maybe their problem is a learning problem or a knowledge and skills problem, in which case they've come to the right person, but maybe the problem has to do with resourcing or with mm -hmm. recruitment or with processes or with the technologies that are being used. And it's okay for LND to say no to taking on, taking on work that has nothing to do with LND. And it's also okay for LND to take on work that is connected to the problem. So how do we understand um, I'm, and I don't like staying in, in like tr being too generic. I'm going to try to think of an example here. So let's mm -hmm, say that mm -hmm. there's um, there's a problem with response times in the call center or with resolution times for requests. And uh, people are coming in with um, very specific questions about refunds, let's say, right? And yes. The uh, manager comes in and says, we need to train these people on XYZ procedure on refunds because they're not answering or resolving the uh, demands quickly enough. Okay, that's okay. But you need to understand what is happening. So I would say even go as far as to observe the people while they're, they're taking calls or listening in on those calls and see what's happening because you would extract a lot of information from listening in on a call where a service agent is explaining the refund policy to um, the uh, customer. And if you hear the person, for example, uh, uh, excuse me, give me a moment while I check, and you see that repeated three or four or five times during the call, you know that that employee has a problem with finding information. Mm -hmm. Is finding information a trainable thing? Maybe there's a beautiful wiki or an FAQ or whatever, and people aren't aware about it, in which case, yeah, sure, we could create a quick guide or teach people how to navigate or inform them about these resources. But what, what if there is no FAQ? So people have to genuinely control F through the procedure to find the right answer, in which case it's a matter of how you're documenting the refund process and making it accessible for people to answer these questions quickly. And mm -hmm. obviously I'm talking about a, a, a bit of an outdated situation because quite often you will find companies that have already introduced chatbots or whatever, right? Yeah. They're, and they're a solution to that. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. But there are companies who haven't, I'm aware of at least three that are quite big that have not introduced that much technology and are relying on people scanning through a job aid to figure out what to answer to these uh, customers. So is that a true LND problem? Maybe some nuances of it are, but maybe some nuances of it are process dependent or documentation dependent. And I don't think LND necessarily has to help here. And I think there's one more mistake that happens when LND takes on a problem that they're not supposed to solve or they can't solve, which is you kind of take on the responsibility of solving the problem. And then mm. when you don't, you're to blame, not the requester, mm. which mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. bad because you you're not you shouldn't be accountable for a failure that doesn't stem from you. 
Mm. I, I, yes. I, and, and just, I think what excites me about that is this is a problem that I hear often where, um, there is that urgency to prove value. And there's also a lack of confidence on being able to push back and say no with a, uh, a business reason why you can't deliver on a particular request. And so a lot of L&Ders are caught between a rock and a hard place where there's the urgency to prove value because of budget cuts and the perception of L&D in the organization. But then there's the actual lack of capability. What can you actually do in your work especially if it's not a learning problem or a systems problem that you can solve or a performance support problem. If you can't provide that solution, then sure, you can uh, prototype and experiment different things. But if you have too many prototypes that fail, then you are no longer a, uh, you're no longer perceived as valuable for the business. So I definitely hear you there. And I think this is all getting, I think we're all, we're, we're, we're providing a lot of context around uh, that big question, and I'm going to push, uh, you know, I'm going to push us to at least put a stake in the ground somewhere. Do we think L and D needs to rebrand or re envision itself? And we'll get to that. Um, I want to, before we get to that, I want to briefly talk about um, an example, examples of where this has gone well, because I think there's a general acceptance. I've heard it all at conferences and talks this year that data processes, systems, perception of uh, L&D within the organization, our ability to take on uh, training or uh, problems that learning and development can solve versus not. I think these are all really systemic problems that um, people need to understand, uh, L&Ders need to understand if they want to understand the full scope of what we mean by, do we burn it all down and build it up from the ashes or do we just, you know, is it slow incremental change? Um, one example that, that I thought of that I uh, from a discussion uh, of how this is going well is uh, I was talking to and I'm, I'm forgive me I'm gonna mispronounce her uh, her last name for sure but um, um, Jenny Molov I think from Sumo Learning Group was telling me about how she um, she, she's working with a lot of uh, her audience is a lot of uh, um, game developers and engineers very technical people. Um, and when you think about what is the role of L and D in, um, and, and the problems that they can solve for this group of people, I think there's, you know, maybe there's a Venn diagram that's like, um, where the crossover between these two groups is something like an interest to, uh, for personal development and psychological safety at work and like these very general elements, but what are, how can L and D actually add value to bringing new skills and better performance to engineers and developers and um, kind of the the tack that the, the strategy that she's taking is less focused on delivering training to these groups of people, but more so how can we bring in expertise from both within the organization and from outside the organization to not only help inspire and provide examples of different or better work, but also um, how can we share best practices that are already happening within the work. And it's not the job of L&D to uh, train other people on what those best practices are for, but really how do we craft the experience that's going to bring these people together and put them in in line with that new experience. And so I think this is all to say uh, it, it's a, not necessarily a novel approach, but rather than training and programs and trying to develop technological systems, sometimes our our job is is best performed when we're just bringing people who are something really good at something and people who need to learn something together in the same space and having them work out what performance looks like as a result of that. And so that's just one, I think we're talking about the systemic problems, but also the bright side that there are people and teams who are doing this successfully. Now, I'm wondering, do you, Liz, have any examples of where folks are rebranding this L&D &D, L &D to the organization or have examples of where there is a shift uh, in how it's, uh, how L&D does work in the business? That's an excellent point. I I think uh, I like this idea and I support this idea that LND kind of needs to get out of its um, expectations from itself, let's say, as a creator of programs and of content and a distributor of knowledge. Uh, it's 
too easy today to access whatever kind of knowledge you need there. You don't need st uh, some sort of structure in place to tell you to go to this program so that you learn game development skills. I can Google this thing. I can YouTube it. I can Udemy it. It's fine. Um, this idea of bringing people together, I've seen it in multiple places. Um, I think there's very, very... Um, there's a lot of value in networking. I saw a post about it, I think, by Amanda Nolan a while ago. And I think I know that Lavinia Mehedin from Offbeat also mentions it quite a lot. LND is in such a kind of like a unique position to know mm. everybody. And because they know everybody and everybody's problems, and ideally they've spent a little time digging into everybody's problems, they would be in a very, very good position to just connect people with each other or to um, help foster communities of practice, right? And I really like, for example, we, we are working with a company right now who is uh, also a game development company and they have, uh, their business units are called guilds. And there's the design guild and the art guild and the uh, development guild and the whatever. There are like eight or nine guilds. And uh, some of them are really quite self-organized. They are um, meeting every now and then. They pick up just a random topic. They record that meeting, including the Q&A at the end. And they just put it in the in, in, in our platform now. Um, and they don't, if, if traditional L&D were to, stomp in and try to create or kind of like force structure upon this, I think it would be very unnatural and it would defeat the purpose of what L&D can add to that situation. Mm -hmm. uh, I really like the way the L&D professional is approaching this in the, in the sense of I'm here to lend a hand. I can help you with orientation, structure, X, Y, Z, and just giving them the opportunity to take whatever they want, to pick whatever they want from the service offering that LND can uh, can provide. Uh, and one example is, for example, sorry, that's redundant. Uh, one example is um, finding really cool speakers or experts in the field and just try to bring them into these community gatherings to have conversations on some topics or to just let people ask questions. And it feels so much better and it uh, does very well on engagement and retention when you have someone who can a who can answer very specific technical questions because mm. these people are already at a level where if they don't know something they can self orientate and figure it out so mm. that's not their problem L and D can't come in here because L and D would be too slow um, not knowledgeable enough it would just create an entire admin overhead to do the whole needs analysis process, put in place something, give it to them and so on. Yeah. Yeah. And I, 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 it's, um, I, I, my favorite, uh, visual when I explain to folks, what is L and D's relationship with the, with the business? Something that we do well is that we're not sitting in the org chart. Like if you imagine the org chart, like a tree and there are main branches and there are the yeah. different business units. L&D doesn't really sit on a particular branch or uh, in, you know, uh, obviously I didn't learn biology. <laughs> Branches, trees, trunks, great. <laughs> L&D is the spider web in the organization where yeah. you are go you are the connection, you, you, you're, we're in a position where we have a, a full view of the business, the connections that we make in the networks and the communities that we build are really our superpower when it comes to um, being able to understand you know how different people are going to impact the performance of the business if somebody is having a particular problem that somebody uh, else is an expert in it's our job to then bring those people together so that the expert can help um, share best practice with the person who's who's ha who's within the the business problem itself and so i think we're really getting to um what i think is the ultimate answer to our question which is uh you know, if we're to think 10 years into the future, Liz, we, we've talked a lot about, you know, this idea of product mindset, data problems, uh, connection, social learning, connection and community 
we've talked about you know moving from training to people and experiences and different types of resources or maybe how l d can partner better by providing some structure but not trying to overstructure an experience or bringing people together or experts together if we were to think 10 years into the future and you you know ceo of nifty learning has grown you've grown to 2000 5000 people and you're writing a job description for an uh, an l d specialist for your company what are three things that this person should have and what you would how how would you describe that in the form of a job description or forget the job description just what are three things that three skills that this person would have that's a tough question to answer um i would say i, I want to can i amend the question a little, a little bit go for it so i would say i think 10 years into the future is too far uh, I think that we might see a, a a significant change to the level of when LMS showed up. I think we might see it in the span of five years, maybe even less. I don't know what that is yet, specifically in learning. I know that AI is obviously very big, but I don't think AI is as earth shattering as LMS was. Um, but that's one thing. I think it's too far into the future. The other thing is, I also think that some things that l and does now, even the new and improved, let's call it, are kind of the responsibility of the organization. And there could be scenarios where you genuinely don't have an L&D person. The way I mm -hmm. see it, the L&D person is kind of like the doctor. The whole point of having l and is to ultimately not need to go to them in a way, in the sense that if your management practices, your leadership, your culture, your compliance, your processes are strong enough and they're applied well enough and they're clearly explained, understood, um, acknowledged, and everybody's accountable for doing their part, I'm not entirely sure you need an l and professional, at least not in-house with some sort of job description, but more like a guardian that learning does happen. And I remember there was, there's this distinction between l and professional and l and practitioner. Anybody can be an l and practitioner. It's just a matter of understanding the principles and focusing on the value that learning can bring. So I'll give one example. Uh, I think it's not, I don't think it's necessarily the job of L&D to do the analysis, gather the analysis. Three months later, finally, we're ready to deploy a program where juniors are helped with XYZ content to become seniors. I think it's much more effective and it uh, works better on retention and engagement and capturing uh, tribal knowledge um, and storing it and not losing it through attrition that you help SMEs also become teachers. And mm. this is where an LND practitioner or professional can become kind of like a consultant on how to put in place this kind of knowledge transfer succession planning activity. Mm. I also think that there's something to be said here about management, proper management should also contain succession planning and part of succession planning is healthy knowledge transfer. So when you ask me what would those three qualities be, I would say, first of all, I'm not entirely sure that there would be an, I think it's better to just think about it as an l and practitioner's set of responsibilities, but that person isn't necessarily the l and person that could be a manager's responsibilities yeah. or someone else, right? And mm -hmm. those things would be have some sort of awareness of the importance of learning in keeping a company together and growing. When I say keep together, I mean, if you have a mentor in the organization who genuinely uh, roots for you and helps you get oriented and uh, keeps you learning or helps you keep learning, that would be amazing for retention. So it impacts that thing, which is an important business metric, right? Then when it comes to um, helping people think about how knowledge gets transferred. You could have someone who knows how to, te how to teach people how to learn. 
because this is something that we don't even do in school and many people don't do their entire lives. Even many LND professionals don't think about the act of learning itself, how that happens, how long it takes, what it implies, what kind of needs someone has, right? So that's why I'm saying this LND practitioner is kind of like a consultant who is a guardian that things happen the right way, things pertaining to learning. So knowledge transfer happens the right way. Why it's important to think about knowledge transfer, why it's important to think about growth, how that factors into a business's competitiveness, its place in the market, mm -hmm. uh, how things so macro as market trends can try trickle all the way down to why it's important to keep our uh, junior employees engaged and help them to grow because that will ultimately uh, keep us competitive in this macro thing, which is a mar market trend. So I don't know if I'm actually answering your question. I feel like I've moved well, it a bit well, too much. I'll but, tell you what. Okay. So, so, so to jump in, because I think you've said a, yeah. a couple of interesting things. One, we're taking that timeline and we're saying five years too far out. And, and I, I think with the pace that, uh, in particular, digital tools are changing. And I think this is what that, what that Donald Taylor quote at the beginning gets at is mm -hmm. that there's a technological shift that's happening now. And um, in my opinion, AI is as big as is as big, if not bigger than an LMS. But that's another episode that we can we can talk about that. But what I will say is that I think you're right that five years is too far and that the pace of technological change is uh, too rapid to say that L&D will have the same or different response, the, the, will have a transformation of responsibilities that are similar to what we have now. And then, uh, uh, sorry, uh, well, one more thing to add, based off what you said, it sounds like we're adding a third option to this, which is completely acceptable. It's not about rebranding, um, which is changing the image. It's not about uh, redesigning the role, which is about transforming the responsibilities, but on a track, but more so uh, do we dissolve if in this might be too much of a hot take but are you saying we might dissolve the responsibility of learning and instruction to kind of like a just a um like you said a guardian or a role where somebody understands how information is processed and turned into learning and work so that, you know, when experiences, and that's something that would, they'd be able to consult kind of in-house and help other experts to make sure they're structuring learning in a responsible way. Is, is that what, uh, is that too much of a, a of a generalization or um, I don't how, be how are we at? Sure. Go ahead. I don't want to be shooting myself in the foot here because I, sure. I, I am aware that this is um, murky territory, right? Sure. Yeah. Um, I think, so, I, I think that many of the things I mentioned uh, just earlier are the, the marks of, a, of an organization that understands that people are important. And the reason I say this is because business thinks business is important, and this is very obvious because of the way we look at business value, the way we measure it, the way everything is about money, growth, profits, and so on, right? Now we're going through this change where people are asking themselves, oh, wait, who's driving all these profits and all this growth? Well, what do you know? Mm. It's people. So then, mm -hmm. then if you, and I, if there's that quote, I think from maybe from Richard Branson, I can um, invest in your people and they will take care of employee of customers. Mm -hmm. Um, I really think that's true because if you manage to understand what drives an employee's, um, you know, interest in staying employed there, their motivation mm -hmm. to do good work, you have to have some conversations about respecting uh, autonomy, uh, giving mm. access to proper information, um, offering people true growth opportunities. Um, and all of these things happen through very healthy people practices. So then the question becomes, where does, where do the L and D type activities fit into these healthy people processes? Yes. Yes. So then the question becomes, who is the guardian of making sure that anything related to learning happens and it happens in a healthy way, sustainably, in a way yes. that drives this value, right? So then going back to your initial question, what kind of uh, attributions or skills would this person sure. have? They would have to be a good sort of 
temperature checker to see if anything is wrong in the organization that is preventing learning from happening. It can mm -hmm. be a culture thing. It can be a budget thing. It can be a process or whatever. Uh, then that means you need to be a good consultant. You need to be good at asking questions, at synthesizing information, at figuring out what's wrong, at speaking to yep. the right stakeholders. Um, then being a good consultant also means that you are creative. You think about interesting solutions. You speak to many people. You connect the people who together could improve the circumstances. I really liked one post that I saw recently from Christopher Lind, and he said that, we know that there are many constraints and you, we know that L&D typically suffers from not having a seat at the table and budgets are being cut and things are rough and so on. But quite frankly, no one is going to, uh, you know, feel more comfortable around a, 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 an L&D person who keeps thinking about the problem and the constraints and keeps complaining about the context. If your context is difficult, figure out why it's difficult and see if you can get creative within those constraints. If it's a mm. money thing, can you get creative with learning by implementing free things? Free things, for example, would be putting together experts with juniors and creating coffee hours, roundtables, AMA sessions, doesn't matter. This is free, right? But it can do such wonders for the organization. And this, I think, is the kind of thing that an, a person with an L&D mindset can think about and um, start to put in place. And it doesn't require money and it doesn't require a lot of effort. You just got to find five cool SMEs that yeah. are willing to do this once a month. And once you do that, you can see a shift in the way, you know, people will start having conversations, asking questions, figuring things, things out. Then maybe a business division thinks about, well, I think we should start defining career paths for people because this it seems like this is one of the topics that keeps coming up in these conversations. And this mm -hmm. is how an L&D person can have such an influence by just thinking about things in a different way. Yes. And so it's, uh, to, and I think we're getting to uh, more towards that future vision, which is returning L and D rather than trying to having, trying to have them do meet every request to build content and courses or deliver training. It's more so getting back to a people first vision of people within the company, looking at how they develop and, um, the information that they're taking in that it is designed for um it is designed for learning and implementation and um and ensuring that you know we're not going to change the constraints and the perception of this work overnight however we can work within those constraints and develop people for solutions uh, and and use our superpower of connecting people across the organization to to achieve performance um just, I guess, one, one, one take, one last, uh, one last question for you, and maybe this is a, another question for another episode. What would the title of this person be? I was, I was just gonna ask if I can add <laughs> one more thing. So, yeah, I think, go ahead. I think it's good to have this notion of chief learning officer. I think the chief learning officer, in the traditional sense, is. You know, I, I I typically mention a lot in my post on LinkedIn that there's there's something really bad with with having vanity metrics in L&D and thinking that's the goal, like number of hours of learning per employee per year. That's I really, really dislike this notion that this is an important thing to look at unless it has a qualitative aspect to it. I just think it's a waste of time. Sure. Um, and. I know that there are, I've, I've even spoken to chief learning officers who pride themselves on having increased that number without any sort of qualitative backing to it. No connection to improved metrics, uh, retention, anything. Just we did more hours this year. So I think it's good to have a role of a chief learning officer, but I think that person shouldn't be thinking about vanity metrics, like five-star ratings or whatever, but more of thinking about fostering a learning culture in the true sense. So kind of like you have a uh, someone who's in charge of quality or someone who's in charge of innovation. These people aren't going to be doing quality measurement themselves. They're just going to be making sure that the company as a whole has quality standards, respects them whenever there's a problem, intervenes and makes an adjustment to the process. Innovation, right? This person isn't going to be 
writing all the new code or sourcing all the new vendors or anything like that. But this person is going to keep people aware and having them experiment and try to make space for them to experiment and keep the company innovative. I kind of feel like the the CLO is the same way and the sense that their responsibility is to think about the organization as a learning organization as well as making you know a product or a service and selling it and whether this organization has the right circumstances to help people learn and that learning hits retention it hits performance it hits business value it hits metrics that are important for the business it also hits people related things right do people feel uh, a, a strong sense of belonging are they aligned with the business's uh, vision and mission and so on and this learning officer is a, a guardian of this learning culture a gu guardian and uh, someone who encourages and figures out way to make this learning culture happen mm -hmm. and this person is also uh, pulling alarm signals if there's something bad for example in leadership practices they're supposed to go and call out the bad leaders and say, this is not behavior that fosters learning. And when you don't foster learning, this is what you lose, risk to lose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and yeah, as I said, this person person doesn't necessarily curate the Udemy course list, right? Maybe they could have someone within the team who does that. Um, but maybe the manager should be curating the Udemy course list because the manager knows best what the person on their team is supposed to be doing. So, mm. yeah. Okay, so we have the, this guardian of learning is the chief <laughs> learning officer, or I, I think the guardian of learning is a, a much more impressive title, <laughs> but, uh, which I'll take. Liz, we've definitely tackled some some hot takes, some sticky subjects here, and I can't thank you enough for for uh, for be willing to dive into those. There's some uh, great nuggets in there. I'm curious if if folks want to get in touch with you, um, what's the best way that they can do that? Um, I'm very much present on LinkedIn. So just find Liz Stefan on LinkedIn or Nifty Learning and you'll find me. Um, and I'm always open to have any sort of conversations, chats. If people are want to explore these topics further, I absolutely love doing that. So thank you for inviting me. Um, yeah, just reach out. I'm very open and I'm happy to always have a talk about learning and development. Sounds good. We'll take it. Well, Liz, thank you so much for stopping by Video Learning Lab. I really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. You too.